we look at your word, as we seek your wisdom, teach us, lead us into truth. Be our teacher, be our guide. Change us through your eternal word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to turn to the Old Testament book of Jonah. Jonah. Jonah Jonah is one of the minor prophets, not because he wasn't important. You have major prophets and minor prophets. Um, He's in the category of minor prophets because uh, the shortness of the book. Uh, It's only four chapters. And for the next three weeks, we're going to march through this entire book together. And we're going to deal with the theme of, of running from God, running from God. So you see our little prop up here, right? This is the universal symbol of surrender, right? Only waved after, you know, much battle, unless you're French. But I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't have done that right at the beginning of the message series. So (laughs) the idea, the concept is surrendering unto God. And so we're going to look at the most preeminent runner from God in the Bible. He's the most famous runner from God as recorded in the scripture. And that, of course, is Jonah. And so it kind of brings up a question. Let me ask you this question as we get started on the message series today. How many of you, from the time maybe you could walk until you got your driver's license, how many of you at one time, in either some small, minor, or major way, ran away from home? Let me see your hands. Keep them up. Yeah, there's a lot of people, right? I did too. (laughs) And we all kind of have something in common, right? Probably it was directed toward our parents. And the thing about runners, when you run away from home, it's always about running away. It's not running to something, right? In fact, you don't even know where you're going. It's about leaving, not going someplace. And so you go to, you know, the curb or the end of the street or maybe the tree and you sit there for a little bit and you decide, well, this isn't working too well. Where am I going to sleep? And, you know, where am I going to eat? That kind of thing. And you go back home. I remember when uh, my middle son, Brandon, he was five or six years old. And, uh, And we were having some kind of, you know, heated discussion. And uh, he was in trouble. And he said, well, I'm just going to run away. And I said, okay, fine. And I opened the front door. And he walks out the front door determined that he's going to run away. He's five years old. And so I'm watching him, believe me, I'm watching him through the window, okay? And he sits in the grass in the front yard, and I can just see the wheel spinning at this age. And he's thinking to himself, what am I going to do? You know, I'm out here. And he begins to cry right there in the front yard. And so I open the door, and he comes back, and, you know, we have a talk, and scars remain forever, you know. <laughs> Not with him, with me. <laughs> I've always felt very guilty about that. He doesn't even remember the experience. But running is about going away, putting something in the past behind. Now, I don't want you to raise your hand, but think about this and ask yourself this question, this follow-up question. How many of you in either some overt or subtle or secret way, again, don't raise your hands or don't nudge somebody next to you. How many of you have ever run away from God? The likelihood is that each and every one of us in this room, in some way or another, have run away from God, have run away from his plans for our lives, has run away from his will, has run away from his calling. We've run from God to a relationship. We've run from God to some kind of financial endeavor of some kind, some kind of business partnership. We've run from God to something else. 
And we begin to rationalize this running away. And this is what we're going to see with Jonah. We rationalize this running away from God and, and we minimize him in some sorts and we minimize his presence in our life and we adjust our theology even maybe to the point where God doesn't really care, God doesn't really exist. And so we change our mindset about who God is. But late at night when we're staring at the ceiling and we're by ourselves and we're honest with ourselves, we remember and we know the fact that God is still with us. And if we're honest with ourselves, we remember and we know that he is a God of love. That he is a God of compassion. And that he wants nothing more than for us to get our lives right with him. Well, that is, that was the story of this guy named Jonah. Now, there are some reasons that we run There are some reasons that we run. Let me list two or three of them for you as we begin this series and this message today. We run, first of all, because other things seem more exciting. I mean, let's just be honest. We're afraid if we surrender to God that we're going to miss out on something really good or something really great. We're going to miss out on some alternative that we desire of some kind. The thing that you've come to believe is that the surest way to ruin your life The surest way for you to have a bummer of a time in life is for you to surrender yourself to God. Now, I don't know where we get that from. I remember having a friend years and years ago who had this same idea about God. She said, I never really wanted to give myself fully to God because I was always afraid that if I gave myself fully to God that he was going to call me to do something that I just hated to do and didn't want to do. She believed that God was going to call her to be a missionary in China. For some reason, she felt like that was the worst thing that could ever happen. She'd have to leave, leave her family and all this kind of thing. This mindset that God was the cosmic killjoy, that he's out to ruin your fun, is a mindset that permeates many people. We run also because we don't want to be under God's authority. Let's just face it. Some just don't want to be told what to do. They have the two-by-four mindset. The two-by-four mindset is you've got to hit them with a two-by-four to get their attention. And they don't want to listen to anybody. They don't want to listen to a parent. They don't want to listen to a friend. They don't want to listen to a spouse. They don't want to listen to a coworker who has their best interest in mind. They don't want to listen to God. And they're determined that they will not be ruled by anyone or anything. And certainly when it comes to relationship to God. So the scenario is this. You know that God doesn't want you to do this thing. But you do it anyway. You know that God doesn't want you with him or her, but you have your hands on your ears, la, la, la. You know, you're not listening. You're unwilling. And there are some people that run because they just don't want to be told what to do, especially by a God in heaven. And then the third reason, one of the reasons that we run is that we're afraid of what God is asking us to do. I mean, if push comes to shove, if you're honest with yourself, you know what God wants you to do. You know that he is asking you to take a step of faith in some area. You know that he is asking you to do something. He's calling you towards something. But you look at that and you say, oh my, if I were to do that. And so you do the cost benefit analysis, right? You say, well, I don't have the resources to be able to do that. I know that God is calling me. I know that God is asking me, but I don't see where it's going to come from. I don't see how it will work out. And you say, I just, I just can't do that because I'm afraid of the consequences. If God does not come through, what then? And so God is calling you to take some kind of step of faith to trust Him. And you're looking inside and you just don't feel it. You don't sense it. And you, God, I... I can't do it. And that decision not to do what God wants, that decision to run from God is really driven by a fear of doing what he wants you to do. Now, all three of these things that I just mentioned are true about this man named Jonah. All three of them are true about him. And the truth is, is his story is our story in some way, shape or form. His story is our story Of these three things I mentioned to you, all three are true in the life of Jonah. So for the next three weeks, we're going to march through this book and we're going to look at this runner and we're going to see patterns in his life that apply to you 
and to me. Let's talk a little bit about who Jonah was, okay? A little bit of background. Jonah was a prophet. And a prophet is one of those guys who in the Old Testament, back in Jewish history, had a very, very difficult job. He was the guy that was assigned to go and tell people things that they didn't want to hear. <laughs> in, in our day and age, we call them parents, okay? <laughs> but assigned to tell people things that they absolutely did not want to hear. And Jonah's job in particular was more tough and, and more difficult than any of the other prophets. Jonah was the only prophet who had been called by God in the Old Testament, the only prophet to be called by God to go not to the Jewish nation of Israel, but instead to go to a pagan nation. In fact, it was more than a pagan nation. It was an enemy nation of Israel. And so, Jonah, if you go to Israel and you go to Jews or you go to a Jewish king like King David and a prophet says something to King David that he doesn't want to hear, King David at least has a context. He says, oh, well, this is a prophet of God. Okay, I'm to accept his word, that kind of thing. Jonah was not called to the Jewish nation. He was called to the Assyrian nation. And more specifically, he was called to Nineveh. And he was called to this brutal empire who were absolutely ruthless and so Jonah in his mind is saying to himself you want me to go where and you want me to do what I mean these are our enemies and God is basically saying to Jonah Jonah this is what I want you to do yes I want you to go to them and I want you to give my message to them and if they don't repent if they don't turn around I'm going to destroy them and Jonah says to himself well let's just skip you know the whole message thing let's just let's just destroy them okay let's go right to the punishment but as we're going to learn from the book of Jonah, that God is a God of compassion. One of the main themes of the book of Jonah is that God extends his love not only to the Jewish people, but to all people. And so Jonah basically says, God, I know you want me to do this, but I don't want to do that. And we can all identify with him. So Jonah lived about 750 B.C. And God says, yes, visit them. And Jonah says, I don't really want to. So let's pick up here in Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. It's tucked away in the Old Testament. You want to maybe go to Matthew and then go six or seven books to the, le to the left because if you start in Genesis, you'll never get there. Okay, You'll never get to the book of Jonah. But Jonah chapter 1, let's begin reading in verse 1. We're going to read, first of all, verses 1 through 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now, here in the beginning of this story, we understand what's going on. God comes and says, I want you to go there. Jonah says, no, I'm not going there. I'm going here instead. And let, let me show you a map, okay? Let's look at this map that's up here on the screen. So you'll see, you see a little Jonah ship right there, right? Isn't that cute? Here's Jerusalem. This is where Jonah was, okay? The Bible says that Jonah went to a port city there close in the Mediterranean Sea, close to Jerusalem, called Joppa. And he got on a boat, and here is Nineveh, 550 miles away by land. Nineveh is over here to the right. Where does Jonah head for? <laughs> Let's see the little boat, see? <laughs> of course, we know he doesn't make it all the way, right? But he's headed toward Tarshish. That's a very hard word to say, by the way. He's going in the exact opposite direction of where God wants him to go. The exact opposite direction as where God wants him to go. And Tarshish is really on the edge of the sea routes, of the trading routes. Jonah bought a ticket to the end of the world. To the end of the known world at that time. Jonah heads out. And so here's Jonah taking off, disobeying God, running from God, and you get this. You understand what Jonah is going through because you and I have been, been there ourselves. God says, I want you to go in this direction. You say, no, as a matter of fact, actually, I'm going in this direction. God says, I, I don't want you to engage in that activity. And you say, no, as a matter of fact, I'm going to engage in this activity. 
I don't want you with this person, with this individual. No, as a matter of fact, that's the exact individual I'm going to go to. Running and rebellious from God. So over these years, as I've, as I've talked to several runners and I've experienced running myself, what I've come to understand is that there are some common characteristics to great runners. Common characteristics to great runners. Let me share here three of them with you from the book of Jonah. The first characteristic of this, and it's really found in verses 1 through 3. Runners run to dangerous, harmful places. They run to dangerous, harmful places. Runners don't tend to make the most logical decisions. <laughs> Runners tend not to make the safest kinds of choices. I mean, let's think about it. Jonah could have just stayed in Jerusalem, right? No, I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm just going to stay right here. He doesn't do that. He sets out for what would be one of the most dangerous choices that he could make. Traveling by sea at that time, at that distance, was a major, major dangerous undertaking. And yet Jonah undertook it. Because he had determined in his heart, in his life, that he was going to run away from God. And so runners tend to take the most dangerous and harmful paths. This is amazing, and it's hard to understand. But those who are running away from God, and again, I've been there myself. Those who are running from God refuse to listen to him and his wisdom. Who, in their rationale, in their rebellion, decide to do the things that outsiders would look at and say, why in the world would you do that? That doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, I've counseled people who, in their rebellion, who knowingly, knowing that God did not want them to do something, I've counseled people who, in their running from God, decided that they were going to get married. Now, that's always a good, safe decision, isn't it? Well, you know what? I'll, God, I'll fix him after the marriage. <laughs> Eventually things will, you know, I'll get him straightened out. Or the opposite is true. People who in their worst moments, people who in their rebellion, people who are running from God who decide to get divorced, they're going to destroy their family. They're going to end the marriage. They're going to hurt the kids. And you scratch your head and you go, why in the world would you do that? And there's no rationale to it except this is the path that I'm going and you can't stop me. Okay. God says, get on the ship. Go your way. Harmful decisions. And so runners do dangerous and risky and harmful things, just like Jonah, because when they run from God, listen, when you run from God, you run from the source of wisdom and truth. And so people make unwise decisions. They make decisions that are based in myth because they are running from the source of wisdom and truth. And not only do they run from God, who is the source of wisdom and truth, but they run from people who reflect wisdom and truth to them. And they run from the places where they are exposed to wisdom and truth. Church. Family. Dangerous, risky decisions. If I'm saying this now and you in your hearts say, how did he know? <laughs> it's because you're not unique. You think you are. You think your journey is different. You think your rebellion is different. You think your running is different. You think that you're going to win at this bet that you're taking, at this gamble that you're uh, experiencing. But if we learn anything from Jonah, who in 750 B.C. had this experience, and throughout the centuries, runners just like him have experienced the same thing, we've got to learn, we've got to wise up, we've got to say, hey, what is true about Jonah may become true about me. So, runners run to dangerous and harmful places. Now, let's look in verse 4. Verse 4, those first three words of verse 4. Then 
the Lord. Then the Lord. Now you see this all throughout the book of Jonah. Then the Lord, now the Lord, but the Lord. Powerful, powerful words that are a reminder to you and me that God is still present even in the midst of our rebellion. Look at what it says, verse 4. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. Now, these are rugged, experienced sailors. This is not their first rodeo. They've been on the seas before. They were not men who became afraid quickly. So obviously, they sensed that something was stirring because they began praying to their gods. There was something else going on here than just, you know, the atmospheric pressure changing. There was something going on, and they began to sense that. And even though they began to sense it, Jonah did not look on in... uh, in verse 5, at the end of verse 5. So all the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. So here's a journey that is now bust. Because they're throwing the cargo overboard, they're not going to make any money. They've decided that in order to save their lives, they're going to ruin the chance of making any money on this ship. Look at this. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. So here's the second thing that's common. Here's the second thing that's true about runners. We learn from Jonah that runners are the last to connect their running to the chaos that it causes. They are the last ones to connect the dots. People all around them see what's going on. People are telling them what's going on. But they are the last ones to connect the dots of what is really happening. And they can't see the fact that what they're doing in their rebellion and their running is causing harm and destruction and chaos. They can't make that connection between their rebellion and the destruction. Now, I've known people, you have too, who for some reason couldn't see it, and they have let everything fall apart in their lives because they were unwilling or unable to see that their rebellion and their decisions were bringing on this destruction and this chaos in their lives. To everyone else, it's obvious. Storms are raging. The ship is in trouble. But they're below deck sleeping. (laughs) And people are trying to wake them up. And these guys are saying, listen, there's a prayer meeting going on on deck. You might want to join us here, okay? There's something urgent that's happening. And yet runners, runners wonder why bad things are happening. Does that make sense? They wonder why the family is falling apart. They wonder why the kids are in trouble. And yet they can't connect the dots that the decisions they're making are actually decisions that are causing the chaos in their families and in their, in their work and in their friends. You know what this means? This means this. It means if you're a runner, it means that your spouse, that your family, your coworkers, your friends, and maybe even your kids will get it before you do. And they will reap the whirlwind of your running. Jonah's decision to get on that ship was a decision that impacted all these other sailors on the boat. And unfortunately, guess what? They were in the ship with him. (laughs) And some of you have been in the ship with those who are running. And the ship is sinking, the storms are raging, and they just can't see it, and they're asleep below deck. So what happens? Well, let's look in verses 7 through 10. Verse 7 Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So now this was an old way, an ancient way of people deciding what to do. Now, in the Old Testament, we read that those who were of faith in Yahweh would cast lots to come to discern what God's will was. And we don't know for sure what the lots were. Some people think that they were similar to dice, and they would fall a certain way. 
and that would reveal what God's will was. So here are some pagans who are actually doing the same thing. This is what they would practice. And sure enough, the, the, the lot fell to Jonah. So they ask him, verse 8, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And he answered this, and this answer actually rocked him. <laughs> I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. So these guys who were pagans, who were heathen, they had gods for all kinds of things. But when Jonah announced that he was a Hebrew who served Yahweh, they understood, they knew that this was something serious. And it frightened them. Verse 10, this terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. So here Jonah boards the ship and he says, well, what are you doing? Well, I'm running from God. Now, they didn't know which God it was. It could have been any God. But now Jonah announces that it is the God of the Hebrews, it is Yahweh, who made the land and the sea the God of the universe. And this strikes fear in their hearts. So they prayed, they cried out, they cast lots, they wondered what to do. And eventually Jonah offers himself, listen, this is because of me. Throw me overboard and the sea will grow calm. And they basically say, no, we're not going to do that. You know, we're going we're to try to get through this. Well, the sea grew wilder and wilder. And eventually they say, okay, that sounds like a good option. <laughs> and so they take Jonah and they throw him out of the boat. And he's there in the water and the sea calms down. And you, you can kind of imagine what those guys on the boat are thinking. You know, they're, they're going, wow. And there's Jonah. He's out there floating along and maybe waving back. And Well, should we pick him back up, you know? Is, the sea is calm. And no, they, they depart. And then this is what happens. Look, now let's skip down to verse 17. Here's another one of those phrases. But the Lord... Then the Lord, now the Lord, but the Lord provided. Look at the intentionality of that word. Look at the providence and the sovereignty. Look at the purpose in that word. The Lord provided. This was from the hand of God. Other translations, the Hebrew actually means prepared. Another translation says, the Lord appointed. The Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. Now, this leads us to the third thing, and I want to say to you about common characteristics of great runners. The third characteristic is this. Runners, eventually, and I believe all of them do. It may take a while. <laughs> runners eventually realize that ignoring God does not make him go away. Ignoring God does not make him go away. They may be the last to see it. But eventually, runners who are honest with themselves look back and they realize that in the ship and in the storm and in the sea and in the belly of that fish, God did not abandon me the whole time. You see, here's the truth. You can run from God. But you can never, ever outrun his love. You can never, ever outrun his presence. God prepared a fish for Jonah. He will prepare something for you. Why? Why? To get even? To pay you back for your rebellion? It's not to pay back. He provides the fish and the storm and the ship and the sea. He provides the pain and the hardship to runners. Not to pay you back, but to win you back. And to bring you back. 
as a runner, you will have then the Lord and now the Lord and but the Lord moments in your life as well. Moments that have very little to do with punishment. But instead, moments to wake you up from the bottom of the deck and to help you to see God's loving power and presence and His plan that fulfills your life. Because this simple truth, because He loves you. You know, the Bible paints the concept, illustrates the truth of God's love for us in the imagery of a father with children. That He is our Father in heaven and that we are His children. And I want to read for you Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. This is a passage that is reflected in the New Testament as well. And we're going to go into this in much more detail next week as we talk about Jonah's repentance and his prayer there inside that fish. Look at what Proverbs 3 says. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he, what? Loves. He disciplines those he loves as a father the son delights in. So if you're overtly running, if you're subtly running, if you're secretly running from God, the Bible's message all throughout it, the Bible's message through the illustration of Jonah, the Bible's message is this. Your Father is looking for you. And you can travel great distances in your heart. You can even pack your bags, literally, and leave. But you can never, ever outrun the love of God. When my kids were younger, we would play hide-and-seek. And this is like, I don't know, when they were three or four, and, you know, brain has not developed quite all the way, and... So we're playing hide-and-seek. I remember the first times that we were playing hide-and-seek, the kids would sit in the game room, particularly my daughter. I remember her doing this. She would sit in the game room, and she would cover her eyes. And she would say, Okay, Daddy, find me. (laughs) And I'm sitting there looking at her, right? But she's thinking to herself, Well, if I can't see him, he can't see me. but I could see her the whole time. And just because you think you've left God, let me say to you, God does not leave you. And just because you can't see Him, it doesn't mean that He doesn't see you. And just because you don't love Him doesn't mean that He doesn't love you. Never changes. No matter how far you run, no matter how far you go, guess what? At the end of all that running, at the end of that journey, God is already there. He was there before you got there. And He waits. And he provides then the Lord and but the Lord and now the Lord moments. And he provides a fish and a storm and a ship and a sea. And he does it not to pay you back, but to win you back. And the reason I know this to be true is because 750 years after Jonah had lived and died, Jesus Christ was born into this world to be the Savior. And God proved once and for all His great commitment to you and me. That He's not the cosmic killjoy, that He's not out to ruin your life and ruin your fun, but that He who gave us His own Son 
Will he not also along with him willingly give us all things? God who has your best interest in mind. God who has the best plan for your life. God who absolutely is committed to you. God who has proved that he loves you. Is the God who is chasing you down. You can keep running. But it's inevitable. Resistance is futile. He's there. And he will always, always be there. So I don't know about you. Maybe you're here because this is your fish. This is your then the Lord moment. Maybe you're here because God's wanting to get your attention. And he brought you here this place on this day to hear this message. To say to you, stop the running. Stop the running. And maybe you're at the point in your life where you're saying, I I give up. God, no more pain, no more ships, no more seas, no more fishes. God, I'm, I get it. God, I, sur- I surrender. You'll find that God was there waiting for you. And you'll find that he will put your feet on a path. If you'll have the courage and the faith to follow him, he'll put your feet on a path toward peace and perspective, toward power, toward his presence in your life. And it will be the greatest adventure of all. An adventure unlike anything else. But you've got to trust your Father in heaven. And you've got to run to Him. So let me just give you this opportunity this morning. I want to ask you to bow your heads. Close your eyes. Maybe you're one of those folks who have just always thought that God was out to ruin your life. You could never see yourself as being a Christian. You could never see yourself as being one of those people. Because in your mind, you, you think it's about what you have to do and what you have to give up. Maybe today the reminder to you is that you, um, you know deep in your heart That God's plan is best. That His ways are highest. That He knows what's best for you. He knows you. He knows what will bring you joy. He knows what will bring you peace. He knows what will bring you ultimate fulfillment. And your Father in heaven is just waiting. And maybe you'd like to turn to Him this morning. So I want to give you an opportunity to do so. Or maybe you know a runner. Maybe you're married to one. Or a child or a friend, some family member. And today you'd just like to pray for them. I invite you to do that. Wherever you are, however... God's word has spoken to you today. Let me just give you a moment to pray and talk to the God who loves you and who has sent his son to die for you. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender. All to him I free. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender Blessed Savior, I surrender. 
Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for the reminder that you're always present. That God, you love us more than anything else. Lord, it's difficult to stop running. It's it's tough. It means faith. It means humility. It means maybe admitting to others that we were wrong. It means finding forgiveness. It means owning up to the chaos and the storms that we've caused. But Father, I pray that you would plant in our hearts a deep picture that the benefit of choosing you far outweighs anything else. And that running to you and finding your love is the life to live. So we pray it may be so. We pray for runners, both in the room and others we know. We pray, God, that you would wake them up through your loving discipline, to the reality of who you are, and that you supernaturally would work in their lives to provide change. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.